Welcome to The Weekly, a podcast brought to you by Calvary Bible Church. I'm your host, Jay Ewing. Thanks for tuning in to us. If you're watching on YouTube, we're in the Boulder campus today. If you're listening online, you should follow us on YouTube. Submit a question there. That's where we pick them up and discuss them. But this podcast today is talking about the Undivided series in the book of 1 Corinthians. We're going to be going over chapter 6 while I sit down with Thomas Milburn. Like always, I want you to stay connected, get connected, go to calvarybible.com, click your campus, find out what's happening in your neck of the woods. All right, let's get to the conversation. Hi, Thomas. Good to sit with you. That's the intro. Yeah. This is the intro now. Don't you say, like, welcome to Calvary? In or the welcome. studio, we get into that by shooting an intro after we podcast. Oh, my gosh. That yeah. just threw me way off. I, I was know. Like, <laughs> I was, I was going to tell you. I, no headphones, no board. No. Yeah. But I do feel like we're in the studio. I mean, this is my first time in the studio. It is? Oh, well, I mean, in, in, the a while. Sense, in the podcast. Yeah, totally. I've, I have given many sermons <laughs> from in here and recorded many videos, but... Yeah. The days you were in exile. Yeah. <laughs> the studio is nice, man. It is nice. Yeah. You got a fancy blue light. This is luxury. For those who listen, you do need to tune in to the YouTube channel to yeah. see There's like Thomas's. giraffes in here and <laughs> unicorns. You know what? It's sort of funny because there's a HVAC system that blows through here. So Mark, time my time. producer, has to text him and say, turn off the heat <laughs> for an hour. Or turn off in the summer, turn off the AC. Yeah, welcome to the studio. Yeah, welcome to the studio. <laughs> that was really funny. Hey, so we're in the First Corinthians series, Undivided, and um, it's a really important time that we've crossed the threshold of First Corinthians 4 into 5 and really into 6. As you said the other Sunday, it's just meat and potato type stuff. The Church of Corinth is messed up. <laughs> uh, yeah, it looks a lot like... Our church. <laughs> I hope not. Uh, not that bad. Uh, yeah. So the first, you know, we're gonna we're gonna turn a page when we get to First Corinthians seven, where he opens up the next chapter by saying, "Now concerning the matters about which you wrote." Right. So then he's gonna address matters that have been written about questions. These are like written questions. What he's addressed so far is what he's heard people talking about. Mm. So either Chloe's household, the reports that he's received, right, and then. Now he's going to address, okay, things that you wrote about, which would be awesome if we actually had that letter. It'd be really interesting. It'd be helpful. Yeah, it would be helpful. Let's pause there and just ask the question. So we're six chapters in now. Mm -hmm. What is striking to you as you've investigated and studied and preached 1 Corinthians that you I, yeah. weren't anticipating? I think what continues to hit home for me is going back to chapter one over and over and over again, is Paul having to say from the from the bat, hey, you already have these things. Mm -hmm. It's like you're, you're living in a way that's contrary to what's already true of you mm -hmm. over and over and over again. And how many times that happens for us where it's just the Genesis 3 story again and again and again where God so loves humanity, he makes humanity, man, woman, puts him in the garden, causes all this opportunity for them to flourish, partner with him, having dominion over the earth, to bring forth its resources. They're, they already have an identity. They're already image bearers. And then the devil comes in and he's like, you know what you're missing? God's holding out on you. Mm. Um, you can become like God. Mm. And what our great ancestors should have said, what we should say is, that's already true of me. Mm. So what the enemy comes in and tries to convince them of is that they're missing out on something that's already true of them. And so again and again, Paul's like, you're already fully enriched, gifted in Christ. Why are you acting in these ways as though this isn't actually true of you? Yeah, that's amazing. I want to pause there too because you're mentioning something that I think many Christians forget unless we're reminded of our identity Yeah, and sort of the Genesis story of Adam and Eve. Man, I can't say how often you go back to those first three chapters of Genesis. You go back specifically all the time. in First Corinthians. I mean, I but think in every sermon series, so? it might be the one repeat <laughs> that yeah, is your thing. Well, but, there, I think there are markers, right? So right. there are like you can't understand Jesus, even like yourself, if you don't understand Genesis, mm -hmm. if you don't understand Exodus, if you don't understand the Psalms, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and then the, I mean, like 
I don't want to say the whole Bible, but I want to say like there are like there are these cornerstone pieces. Yeah. Well, David reminds us in Psalms that he, it was a delight to meditate on the law of God. Yeah. He's just t- talking about the first five books, people. Yeah. Like that's what he's reading. Yeah. And he says it's a delight. And you're like, have you ever read Numbers, David? And he's like, yeah, I, I open this up and I think, oh my gosh, God's so good. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe the encouragement for us is that we should, if we haven't in a while, open up those first five mm-hmm. books and really put them in our hearts. Yeah. Because they are foundational to how we experience the New Testament. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So if we're going to read Genesis again and make sense of it, what what helps would you say were helpful to you in this whole investigation? Well, you think about everyone's identity is given to them. Mm-hmm. Like We don't actually self-generate. That is, that is a very true statement. So we, we pick them up. Right. right, and what the scripture st- story is the narrative there is, hey, the identity that has been given was given from the beginning that you were loved, made mm-hmm. on purpose, with a purpose, for a purpose, you know, all of that. Right, and then you pull out of that. Well, well, then how do I live? How do I live in relationship? How do I live in conflict? How do I live in every single scenario based on that identity? Right. If you if you take a world ad- identity that's like you are a total accident. You are the, the result of a of a cosmic accident. Yeah, essentially. And some ama- no one ribus. thought about you. Yeah. No one wanted you. You have no value. You totally. didn't come from anywhere. And you're not going anywhere. And then you're trying to figure out how to live this life. Then just follow whatever passions you have. You're angry. Okay. Be angry. You you're vengeful. Be vengeful. You're you have the sex drive. Satisfy. You're hungry. Eat. Right. And Paul's trying to. I mean, I think the scriptures are always trying to unwind that. And say no, no, no. That's a worldview that will lead to death. Yes. Here's a different worldview. So it's, that's why you go, keep going back, go back. It's interesting to me how much Darwin and Machiavelli is in our culture. Yeah. Those two, specifically how they play out in the real life. Because I've been thinking about this a lot lately, especially as we approach the Advent season, is like, I don't actually think we believe that God created us and actually He's in charge of our today. Yeah. Does that make sense? Oh, if, if think about the ways it would change if you started embracing these truths as lived realities. Right. Wow. So we go back to Genesis, and we we're encouraging once again to pick up your stories of Genesis through the first five books of the law, right? Mm-hmm. Be familiar. Have a heart around those things. Learn who God is and what he's doing in the world. And we get to 1 Corinthians. Six, and there's lawsuits and sexual immorality, and it's it's messy. Yeah, it's a messy church. So, what are your reflections? You know, in the last two weeks of chapter six of like suing brothers and sisters in Christ, the things that happen in the second half mm-hmm. of sexuality here. What's your take on all this? Yeah, I think again, if you read the whole chapter six, um, there's a refrain. That happens here. I think it's seven times out of the nine or ten times it's used in the entire book. Oh, that's interesting. Which okay. is, do you not know? Okay. Do you not know? Do you like? Are you unaware of right. this? And Pastor Zach did a really nice job in Thornton this past week highlighting that for the second part of six. Right. And it's almost like a, it's a criticism. Mm-hmm. It's like you should know this, right? You know, it's that sarcastic like, language that he's used, yeah, in previous a little bit. Yeah, and it's. I mean, yeah. I can't remember the. I think he used like. Uh, Culver's chicken as an example, like where someone has like a belly ache, they don't feel good. And you're like, did you not know like what happens when you eat Culver's chicken, you know, or like you ate McDonald's, what were you thinking was going to happen? Right. Um, That's what Paul's saying. Almost like not, did you not know? Whoa, I didn't know, but you kind of knew actually, Mm -hmm. and you're choosing not to believe it. Mm. So did you not know? And then he goes through their identity. Like, did you not know these things about, you're going to judge angels. You're going to judge the world. Did you not know that you are members of Christ, that you are temples of the Holy Spirit? And it's a way of re- kind of criticizing, rebuking them, and then calling them back to their identity. Yeah. So the church has really just lost sight of, you know, who they are and what they're supposed to do. So what are we supposed to do then when we have a grievance with a brother or sister who goes to our church? Yeah. Let's get down to the nitty gritty. Yeah, there was someone who came up after that one. So in the first part of six, Paul's talking about grievances, mm-hmm. um, 
I think he he makes them small offenses. These are not crimes, right? right. So he said if there's if it's illegal, if we're talking about murder, abuse, uh, embezzlement, like you have to make that known. It has to be addressed to the public authorities. To the public authorities, absolutely. Yeah. And then again, it doesn't say you ignore these things. Mm -hmm. The question is, where do you address them? So grievances, sins, offenses, they all have to be addressed. Never does it say sweep it under the rug. But it says, where do you address it? And the church had gotten it backwards saying, okay, we're going to address all these things outside the church, and then we're not going to address the things that are happening inside the church, blah, blah, blah. But when you have a grievance, it's one-on-one, man. It's like, hey, Thomas, what you said really hurt my feelings. Mm -hmm. And this happens all the time with me because I use a lot of words. Like for a living, right? I speak, right? Right. And if you use a lot of words, you're prone to use words that hurt people, offend people unintentionally. Mm. And my response is, I'm sorry, that made you sad. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> that's not a good response. No, that's not a great response. No, the, good, the, the response is, man, I'm, I'm really sorry. Yeah. I wasn't thoughtful. There. So if you have a grievance with someone, brother, sister in your life group. Yeah. Uh, your women's Bible study, men's Bible study, and you have a hard time going to them with that, and you do, and they do not listen. What are you, what, what are you supposed to do after that? Yeah. Then I think we're doing Matthew 18, right? Mm-hmm. We talked about where you're, you're grabbing a trusted uh, company. Yeah. So it might be, hey, Thomas has really offended me. I've approached Thomas. He said, I'm sorry, you feel that way. You know, I don't care about your feelings. Right. Uh, I don't think he took that seriously. So then they go, you go to, you know, Brother Mark, mm-hmm. and you're like, Brother Mark. We don't call each other brothers. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's just my Bible college days. Do we not call each other brothers and okay. sisters? Bro. 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 I need your help. Bro, Mark. Yeah. We, we need to, I need you to help me with something. Yeah. All right. And hopefully, the first thing you're doing is like, okay, let's pray. Mm-hmm. Let's pray that he has a, a right response, you know. And if we're wrong, we have the right response. Right. So then again, it's, it's one or two people that are witnesses. And that's the other thing. It's like, maybe they've witnessed this as well. Right. So again, it's not widespread. It's not like, hey, put this on the prayer chain for everyone to pray about it. <laughs> uh, or tell your whole life group that we got to have a you know a confrontation with someone. Right. But all right, now that there's two or three of us going. Yeah. And hopefully my heart is softened. Maybe the Holy Spirit's done a lot of work on me. If not, and you still see it's like, it is my grievance or my offense that has caused this grievance. Then it's to the church. And yeah. I really love this rule of thought. It was like, who needs to know within the church? Is this like a Sunday morning thing with a few thousand people? And I think it was actually Tim Keller who made this statement. I think it's from the Presbytery. He is, as far as the sin is known, is as far as the company is informed. Mm-hmm. So you don't need to inform a bunch of people like, hey, you never knew this about this person's offense. Mm-hmm. Now we're going to tell you about it. Now we're going to correct them. It's like, well, how 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 effective or how informed was this or how well known right in in first corinthians man it seems like everybody knows about this everyone sort of knows about so it sounds like that's a whole church issue right now there are circumstances when you have leadership failure where because of their position you're going to have to make the whole church aware right and we see that like our heart, hearts grieve recently where church leaders have failed and the broader company has had to know even like very well known speakers or pastors. Right. Well, you got to let even those those communities know. Mm-hmm. So it's important, but it's not as though like, hey, I have one offense. Let everybody know about this. Right. And then we crucify them on Sunday. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. But you're I, gonna be in conflict. I think that's the other thing is, how many people leave a church because they had conflict? Yeah, too many. And you're like, where are you gonna go? Or you're not gonna have conflict. Yeah, and it's like if you're looking for the perfect church, and you find it. I would be scared. I'd be suspect. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be very scared of the perfect church. Very much so. So I think the middle part of six is very hopeful because at the end it says, says, and such were some of you. He was going through a list of things in which they were. Yeah. And, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. I love this thing because Paul uses the language we use and some people criticize it as churchy language. No, it's called biblical language. <laughs> yeah. These are things the Bible uses to describe certain things. Sanctification, justification. Let's talk about that. He's sort of in this middle of this chapter pointing to the reality of what God has done on yeah. him. The sanctifying work of Jesus Christ and the justifying. How does those play out in our day-to-day? Well, don't you think 
there, there's kind of there's multiple ways to kind of motivate a Christian, right? Um, and I think the biblical way to motivate what the scriptures actually teach is reminding people what God has already done. So God is primary actor. Wait, they don't just try to fear, you, scare you into fear. To yeah. do well, there's the a right lot of things. ways to do it. It's like, man, Jesus would be disappointed in you. Oh my gosh, He's coming back today. Yeah, if he, if He showed up, yeah. where do you want to be? Right. Uh, and Paul takes the right tact, which is, hey, remember. The old things are no longer true of you. Mm. What Christ has done is true of you. You've been washed, so like the stain of sin is gone. Mm. You're being sanctified, right? So now you're being changed, right? And then you're justified. The penalty of that sin is is gone. It's gone. Mm. Now live out of that, as opposed to hey, do you really want to earn these things? You want to be clean? You got to do this. You want to be sanctified? You got to do this. You want to be justified? You got to do this, right? And so Paul takes the right tact to saying, hey, let me remind you, old gone, and who Christ has done who you are again. Yeah, the truest expression of who you are. And I, th- I think this would be a question for anyone who's struggling with, you know, the variety of issues. Right. Is do you not know who you are? Mm. Yeah. And let it, that settle into you. Yeah. And so if you're if you're really insecure in that identity, if you're really insecure of your past, if you're really insecure of what people think about you, I mean you're gonna live out of that. Right. But if you can if you can bolt in the identity that Christ has given us, oh my gosh. Yeah. Free. Gotta, That's freedom, man. Yeah. I've got to say that going back to this, wrapping up this first section of First Corinthians 6, being a pastor and sitting in the room with reconciliation of two individuals who are brothers and sisters in Christ is a beautiful thing. Mm-hmm. The problem is most people don't want to do it. No. They don't want to do the hard work of confrontation, yeah. which is super interesting because you're like, this is what it means to be a Christian. Yeah. Is to learn to get along with each other now because we learn to get along with each other later in eternity. Yeah. So if you're avoiding Jay Ewing now at Calvary, just wait until we get eternity together, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, we're all unbound at that point from our sins. Right. I know I'm with you, though. The, the principle is the same, right? Right. We should be living into ultimate reality. So what is ultimate reality? Is you and me in fellowship forever. Right. Okay. Well, if that's the ultimate reality, why don't we just lean into that now and do the hard work now? Right. Now, with the first part of Corinthians, they're saying, hey, we've addressed this person. They're they're not repentive. Um, you need to actually put them outside the community. Right. right. So you're going to remove them for, from full participation. Yeah. Now, what what's interesting to me is they go to Matthew 18 or they look at this and they say, see, treat them like a tax collector and a Gentile. No, no, no. And you're like, well, that's what Jesus says to do, yeah, right? You're yeah, like, yeah, yeah, treat them like a tax collector and Gentile. And you're like, okay, so how does Jesus teach us to treat those, you know, terrible tax collectors and Gentiles outside the church? You're like, oh, to win them right. over, yeah. to win them to faith, right. to serve them, to bless them, to pray for them. Those are your enemies, right? If you're thinking about even enemies, that's how you treat them. So by removing someone from full participation in fellowship, what's the goal is to win them back, right? right? So treat them, in a, you're treating them a different way. But you're treating them in, the, in a sense of, I want to win you to faith, when you win you back to relationship. And hopefully the the absence of you in their life mm. helps bring some repentance. Because, gosh, what it seems like the church is dealing with is pride. Right. This would be pretty humbling to be put out of the community. Because in Corinth, in Corinth how many churches are there? Uh, one. I, I, I think there's one, right? Corinthians. <laughs> this is it. On the block. <laughs> <laughs> so to be removed from the church is a big deal. Right. Um, today... A lot of churches like don't do some any sort of church quote unquote church discipline right. because if you confront me, what do I do? You just go to second, just Corinthians. go to second Baptist, third <laughs> Baptist, fourth Baptist, right? You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. I remember being in uh, in Tennessee in the Smoky Mountains, and there's this loop. I can't remember what the loop's called, but you can ride your bike. It's like 18 miles or something like that. Mm-hmm. And as you go, you see all these homesteads that were there originally. It's amazing. And you get to like the Baptist church. And I'm like, whoa, they had a church here. I'm like, yeah. And then you ride a little bit longer, and it's like the Methodists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the Catholics. It's like, man, even in this small community that was just starting here in the Smoky Mountains, a bunch of Christians were like, can't worship with them. Yeah, I can't worship with them. It's, yeah, it's interesting. And it's about, it's unity is about our example to the world. Yeah. It's not actually about us. It's about, it demonstrates to the world that we are one in Christ, just like as Christ is with the Father, right? Yeah, John 17, where Jesus prays for us. Yeah. 
I just think Jesus thinks about us in Erie, Boulder, Thornton, Colorado, and then really the, the church universally. Mm-hmm. Um, he says, I pray that they'd be one, that the world might know that you sent me. Like, how does the world get convinced that Jesus is the Son of God and that he was sent? Mm-hmm. Like, look at how all those people mm-hmm. in the diversity of thought in the way that they offend each other often, stay together. Yeah. Only an act of God right. can only. keep those people loving each other. And only the Spirit of God who produces the fruits of the Spirit can keep them together That's, that's well. a better, way, better yeah. way of saying it. Yeah. Yeah. Those people must be filled with something. They must be filled with something, yeah. Okay, so it goes into this chapter 6, verse 12, and he uses this phrase that I did not know was a phrase from Corinth itself which is all things are lawful for me. Yeah. It was the an expression of the day that you pointed out. And I was like, man, 20 plus years into reading my New Testament, and I didn't know that. That's so super cool. It, you, know, you know what I mean? It's like fresh fresh bread fresh every bread. time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll see this more and more as the, as the book goes on okay. because he's now concerning the things you've written about, right? Um, so there's Corinthian slogans or the things that they had written about, and the translators help us in English catch what that is by yeah. putting quotes. Now, just to throw it out there, one of the challenges in interpreting 1 Corinthians for scholars, and I'm not even I'm not a scholar, right. is do you have all the right slogans? Mm. And this becomes challenging as you go through it because you're thinking, okay, did that slogan end there or does it continue further? Mm. So, for example, when he says, you know, food for the body and body for food and both will be destroyed – in our translation, and it will be destroyed, is not in quotes, meaning that they don't, these interpreters do not say that that's part of the slogan. Right. However, some interpreters would say, no, that's the continuation of it, in which Paul refutes by saying, surely he's not going to destroy all of this because he's going to raise our bodies up. Right. And so this becomes one of the interpretive challenges of, mm. can you identify all the Corinthian slogans or questions and the length, the, the fullness of them? Yeah, I bet archaeology and that's, Field has helped investigate those slogans. Yeah. Because there's got to be those slogans written on things within Corinth or the surrounding area. Yeah. That would be like, and oh, yeah. Just the volume of texts that right. we have are very, very helpful. So we, that shouldn't put anybody's doubt in the book. Right. But that's that's important to recognize as you're going through. And the translators are helping us by putting those quotes. Now, not everything that's quoted is a Corinthian slogan because it says, it is written. Mm-hmm. Now, that's is written in the scriptures. Right. So what the, what the quotes are indicating is that that's not Paul's words. He's lifting it from somewhere. So either from the scriptures, or from the Corinthian of the day, the Corinthian texts of the day or slogans of the day. Well, I think it's really important that Paul was a reader of culture and uh, underst- he understood what was going on and the phrases and like he's not in a vacuum. Yeah. He's not a Christian dropped into the world in the alien form. He's like he's like oh yeah I've read the newspaper I've checked reddit like i know what you say yeah you know what i mean it's like that's pretty cool well think about i mean what are, what are the slogans that come to your mind from our modern era um my body my choice my body my choice yeah that'd be a very yeah. political charge one right now um is you pointed out yolo yolo you which is once. dying out yeah but um i would say sigma if my teenagers were kind of involved <laughs> right now <laughs> Or him or her, which means sort of the goat. Yeah. Of the whatever it is. Those are phrases. Yeah. What phrases come to your mind? I mean, I think it's funny because you think every brand almost has a slogan. Just like, do it. Just do it. Yeah, until I think about it. Yeah, that obey too. your thirst. Obey your thirst. Yep. Yep. Like, okay, so if I start embracing, embracing these slogans, I start living in a direction. Mm-hmm. And so you have the Corinthians who are living in a direction, specifically with their bodies. Mm-hmm. With these slogans, all things are permissible for me. Yeah. And he's addressing, he's addressing a very specific issue in Corinth, which is temple prostitution. Right. So you've been living in Corinth forever. To Corinthianize means to actually engage in temple worship with prostitutes. Right. If we remember from chapter 1, there's a temple in Corinth above the city in which prostitutes would come down daily yeah. in order to offer their bodies to individuals within Corinth as a form of worship. So you have these people going, who cares? Like, if... if Grace covers all, right? And the body doesn't matter because you have some you have Greek thinking in your right. mind, or maybe you're Gnostic in your mind. Like, who cares about what happens to the body? What's the big deal, right? And Paul's going, okay, here's here's a couple things. Uh, first of all, don't think that way, right? Start thinking, is it helpful? 
Like, is your is your wife benefited by you going to temple worship? Right. You know, are your children benefited? Is community benefited? Are you benefiting that other human being? Mm-hmm. Um, then also, like, I'm not going to be dominated by anything. So yeah, you're free to yeah free to enjoy alcohol. Right. Um, what if you became dominated by it? Right. So one, is it beneficial for you? Like, how does it benefit your life in in the sense of growing you into Christ likeness? Right. Two. Is there a threat that you're owned by it? Mm-hmm. That's a real big deal. And that then, is a very big deal. Paul, go on. And then, actually, do you even know what your body is? Yeah, which I think was a beautiful, and I love that we highlighted a catechesis of a catechism, a phrase in which has been grounding the church over centuries, um, over and over again, to help us understand who we are and what Scripture means about us. Yeah, in simple teaching form. That's what catechism is. Yeah. And you highlighted the Heidelberg Catechism, which is um, what is the only comfort in life and death? It is the first question of the first chapter of the first page. Like, I was like, you want to start somewhere? Let's start with this question. Yeah. What is your only comfort now and forever? If you think about it, though, it's a culture in which death rate were really high compared to what we are now. Um, People lived in marginal means. And so they had to look outside of their present circumstances for a vision of the good life. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, but you could even... But I even is to now. I was going to say, think of it this way. If you were to throw like a man on the street video. Yeah. Is that, is that like an old thing? It's probably that old is definitely thing. old. What's the new way of saying it? If you were going to post a question on TikTok. Okay. Or have a... Viral moment under a hashtag. Okay. And you're going to ask this question. So you're like, Times Square. I don't know. I'm making this up, man. I'm in my 40s. Dude, I don't, I I can't keep up anymore. Remember meeting a 40 year old like when you were in your 20s? Oh, man. Death's doorstep. (laughs) Yeah, the guy's old. (laughs) Now we're well into our 40s. Um, All right. So if you ask him, what is your your only comfort in life and death? Think about the ways that could be answered. It's like, um, eat, drink, be merry. Yeah. Yeah, have securities, totally financial security for retirement. Have fun in it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, have a house, buy a car, have a second house. Like, what do you mean only comfort? Right. And this is like only means like primary. Like, what is what is it? What's the only really thing that matters? Right. You gain the whole world, but you forfeited your soul. Like, what's really the only comfort in? And I want you to read it because I have it in the older English translation. But the answer is this. The answer to the question is that I am not my own. I think that just off the bat. You need to sit with that in the 21st century. Yeah. You are not your own. That's a comfort to you? It, it's it's I mean, a it's stark just, reality to yeah. me. Yeah. Think about that. A comfort to you is that you do not belong to you alone. That's My whole formation, my 40 plus years of life, is actually telling me that's not right. Yeah. That's actually a discomfort that is a in our modern world. Yeah, that is a discomfort very much so. So he goes on that I'm not, it's actually a comfort that I'm not my own because, yeah. oh man, this is good, but belong with body and soul. And that's what it means to be human. A human being is an embodied soul. Right. So you're not, there's not a dualistic view. To be human is an embodied soul. So I belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. That's, that's the, that's the, or a lot of it just stops. Right. Take that first line. That's like, Good children's catechism. So what's my only comfort in life and death? It's not a house. It's not financial securities. It's not retirement. None of that. It's that I actually don't belong to myself. Yeah. I belong to another, my faithful Savior in life and death. And this is why. And it's interesting because here you're going to see Trinitarian theology. Oh, totally. You're actually going to see Trinitarian theology in 1 Corinthians. Oh, yeah. I was that, going to say in verse 11 it was there. Yeah, we're, we're for God. Yeah, both both in the 11 and then throughout the, the rest of the chapter. Right. Is you have God the Father, you have the Son, Spirit, and the Spirit. Yeah. yeah. Um, Keep on reading. So he has, so that I belong to my faithful Savior Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with His precious blood, and has set me free from the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore. By his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life 
and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. Mm. That's, that is the comfort in this life and in death that I belong to him yeah. and that he's working all things for my good and that he will preserve me and actually causes in my heart to be heartily willing from now on to live for him. Yeah, until eternal life. Oh, man. Which I'm sealed. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And then the world, world's like, hey, do you have a Chevy? Are you a Chevy guy? Yeah, I got an iPad I want to sell you. Yeah, oh, don't be an iPad person. Don't be an Apple person. Be a yeah. Samsung person. Be an independent, totally. man. Be an independent. We got some cool shoes. You want to buy them? Want to belong to this political party? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, man, the world is just trying to sell you a place to belong. Everywhere. And it's like, my only comfort in life and death is that I don't belong to myself, but I don't belong to any of that either. Mm-hmm. I, fu- I fundamentally belong to my Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, man. And then Paul says in 6, uh, 20, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Mm. He's like, okay, this is who you are. Yeah. This is this is your mission, to glorify God. And your body's a part of that. It's just not your soul. It's just not your willingness. It's yeah. It's your whole being. Amazing. It is amazing. Okay, so... I guess to end, what? How should we shape our day after First Corinthians six for this week? Like, what is my Wednesday and Thursday? What does my next Saturday look mm-hmm. like because of this reality? Well, think about all the ways in which you get to create with your body, mm-hmm. that you get to serve with your body, that you get to build with your body, that you invent with your body. And so when you wake up in the morning, it's like a spiritual thing that's happening in me is what I do with my hands, right. where I allow my feet to go, what I'm going to do with my strength, where I'm going to put my ears and my eyes, what words I'm going to use. Like, how do I produce life with this thing? Right. Because that's what God has given me. Is you Remember, he originally put Adam and Eve in a garden to have dominion over it, to care for it, to bring forth its resources to the betterment of humanity. Mm-hmm. That's what we should do. And so we have all sorts of desires. And those desires aren't always helpful. And a lot of those desires will get us enslaved in bondage. Um, think about even the ways in which envy and greed in our culture. Mm-hmm. Like we got the, you got Thanksgiving and Christmas coming up. Black Friday, right? Yeah. Shop till you drop. The whole economy is built on envy and greed and covetousness. Right. Like I want. And so think about how much we're going to spend this season potentially even putting ourselves in debt. And then who owns you? MasterCard becomes your master, right? Yeah. You're no longer free. Yeah. And so when you come around to church maybe in December and we say, hey, there's an opportunity. We're going to feed people who have no food and would otherwise die. Let us collectively contribute financially. Let's, let's say no to a few gifts, a few luxuries, a few expenditures, and collectively give so that other people would have food in their stomach. Yeah. And you're like, I wish I could, but i got to pay my MasterCard bill. Because I, I purchased on Black Friday. Because I didn't know how to control my body, yeah. my appetites, right? That's, That's so what good. Paul's going after. So, like, this is a thousand times played over. And what I appreciate from First Corinthians 6 is instead of Paul being like, do this, don't do this, you know, yeah. he says, let me give you a principle. If you would know how to think and what your body actually is, members of Christ and a temple, a mobile sanctuary in the world, um, you can figure out how you should live. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can figure it out. Oh, man. Thanks, Thomas, for sitting down. Calvary, I want to leave you with this. As we think about uh, 1 Corinthians 6 and get ready for 1 Corinthians 7 this next week, uh, Paul reminds us in Romans 12, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what the what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And Calvary, we're praying that you do that this week. We're praying for you individually. Like always, you can go to calvarybible.com, stay connected, get connected. Also, submit a prayer request. We love to be praying for you. Please, 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 you can do that digitally there at the Church Center app or on our website. But we are praying that you do not conform, as you're praying for us to not conform to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of our minds so that we know what's good and acceptable and perfect for this week here as we live on the front range in 2024. 
All right. Thanks for tuning in. Talk to you next time. Thomas, it's always a pleasure. <laughs>